Hi guys, it is, imagine that, it is a cold, rainy, gloomy day in the Catskill Mountains on the last day of spring 2019, but we're going to go all the way across the planet right now, heading down to what I guess is winter time in Australia, where I have the long overdue pleasure and honor of speaking with Bill Lawrence. I have mentioned Bill's work many times on this channel and we are going to get much deeper into it today but for those of you not quite sure who Bill is, Bill Lawrence is a distinguished research professor at James Cook University in Cairns, Australia and also holds the Prince Bernhard Chair in International Nature Conservation at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. His research over the past 35 years spans the tropical world including the Amazon, Africa, and Asia-Pacific regions and his research focuses on the impacts of intensive land uses such as habitat fragmentation, logging, hunting and wildfires on tropical forests and their biodiversity he is also interested in protected areas, climate change, the impacts of roads and other infrastructure on biodiversity, which is going to be what we're talking about today, and conservation policy. He has published eight books and over 600 scientific and popular articles. Professor Lawrence has received more scientific honors than I can even list here. And finally, he is the founder and director of ALERT, the Alliance of Leading Environmental Researchers and Thinkers. So, Bill Lawrence, come on and say hi to the folks, and we're going to dive right into it. Hi, Sam. Morning from Australia. All right. You should see the, uh, the downpour that is erupting here in New York. Hopefully, this will not mess with our Skype connection. So anyway, Bill, what we are going to be, what I want to center our conversation on mostly today is this infamous Chinese Belt and Road Initiative where you are going to try to hit us over the head with exactly what this means for the planet. But I think we're going to start out not in China, but we're going to start out in Brazil uh, and I want to get your feedback on the recent ascension to the throne, as it were, of President Jair Bolsonaro. Bill, what does Jair Bolsonaro mean for the Amazon rainforest and the planet? Well, Sam, I, I think pretty much any objective observer would say it's Bolsonaro is, is bad news across the board when it comes to the environment and also to indigenous peoples. Um, he's come in very aggressively. Um, he's become known as sort of the tropical Trump for what it's known, for what it's worth. And he's attacking uh, the environmental protections and um, environment and uh, advancing industrial and large-scale development interests uh, essentially across the board. And it's hard to even pinpoint a single thing that he's doing because he's working at so many different levels and in what, so many different ways. So everything from undercutting the administ administrative capacity of, of experts that have been in place for a long time, sort of blackballing people to changing the laws overtly, to promoting massive new development projects that would sort of open up, uh, rip open um, the Amazon like a flayed fish uh, because it'd be penetrating right into the heart of the basin, giant projects that tend to lead to lots of deforestation and forest fragmentation and big hydro dam projects. I mean, he's essentially reversing uh, what's been 10 or 15 years of pretty good news for the Amazon. I mean, we, we were, I've worked at the Amazon for about 25 years and uh, lived there for six years. And we've seen from the early 2000s um, till, uh, well, you know, a few years ago or a couple years ago, 
the things had improved a lot. The rate of deforestation had dropped by 75 or 80 percent a year. And the reasons for that we can talk about. But then Bolsonaro's come in um, and he's, you know, a populist. He's very Trump like um, in his sort of manner and views. And he's uh, had an extremely aggressive uh, pro development policy. And uh, Amazon watchers are more worried right now than any time I've ever seen uh, going back until the 1980s, 1990s, and early 2000s when Brazil was destroying an area of the Amazon rainforest um, in some years about the size of Belgium. So up to 3 million hectares. Of, of, so that would be, um, sorry, I have to convert 7 million, 7.5 million acres of uh, rainforest every year. Incredible rate. Uh, you know, people used to talk about it at something like 20, 20 football fields a minute. I mean, it's just astonishingly uh, fast. Is that happening again? Are, are we seeing evidence that that's exactly what we're going to return to? Not back to that level yet, but it's definitely bouncing back up. And um, I haven't checked the very latest statistics, but I've seen headlines saying things like in the last three months, the rates have come back up. I mean, remember, we dropped down to about 20 percent of what the deforestation rate had been. And then essentially it's then doubled or more than doubled um, recently. So since Bolsonaro has come into office. So I think that, you know, the trends are basically moving in the wrong direction. I, I, I think everyone hopes that the Amazon would never go back to the kind of, you know, hell on fire days that we've seen um, in the past there were just you know, rampant destruction and illegal activities, illegal blogging, illegal land grabbing. Um, just this onslaught was happening daily. Um, but Bolsonaro's, you know, Brazil, in many ways, Brazil had a lot of protections on paper, but what they lacked was enforcement and they lacked the they lack the capacity to monitor effectively. So since then, they've developed good satellite technology. They've done a very good job of linking that satellite monitoring of deforestation which with actual on-the-ground uh, information and, and, and enforcement. And what that's done is it's cr they've had a, a crackdown on all the illegal activity. And, and some people, and you know, particularly some of the really wealthy people, have become even more enriched and more powerful um, as a consequence of all this illegal logging activity and land grabbing. And, and so they were very, they've been very upset by this. And, you know, it was like, well, hang on a second. It used to be that, you know, when you did something illegal in the Amazon, you almost never got caught. When you did get caught, you almost never got charged. If you did get charged, you almost never got convicted. Uh, if you did get convicted, it was just a matter of maybe paying a small fine or possibly paying off yeah. uh, a, a prosecutor or a judge. So with some enforcement coming into place now, what we've seen is it's kind of um, rebound effect or this reaction effect where some of the big forest exploiters have gotten very unhappy. And now they basically are backing people like Bolsonaro, okay. who is doing his level best to try to... Um, open up uh, large-scale destructive development in the Amazon again. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I was going to save this question for later in the interview, but let, let, let's, jump, let's jump right ahead to it, and then we're going to connect the dots between uh, Bolsonaro and Brazil into the larger subject. But before we get into this, with all of these trends heading in the wrong direction and lack of enforcement. I think Manga Bay was just did a long article last week about how they just gutted any environmental enforcement down there. With all these trends heading the wrong way, I think it's I, I probably is, is from you or, or, or somebody like you. Uh, I have heard the statistic that if 30% if 30% of the Amazon rainforest gets, quote, destroyed, that it could literally tip 
and just and, and just crash and burn and uh, and I think even before Bolsonaro got there we were what past 20 I mean is there a chance that that Jair Bolsonaro during his term could actually send uh, the Amazon rainforest over a tipping point to which it will never recover from yeah Look, I'd probably start off by saying, Sam, that the work, and I'm very familiar with that work, the, and it's basically you know, work based on complex computer models that suggests that, say, 30% of the deforestation is going to be where the Amazon hits the tipping point. Firstly, we've got to be clear that we're not exactly sure where that tipping point is. And that's one of the things that's kind of even more scary, because the tipping point could happen tomorrow. Um, or it might not happen, you know, until you hit perhaps 40%. What we do know is that the Amazon is a unique system that essentially generates much of its own rainfall. And uh, it's a, when you get a combination of two things, one is you get a vast area of forest, and, you, and it's, the forest is a long way from the ocean by nature because it's so large. Much of the Amazon is far away from the ocean, which is where you get the moisture-bearing winds. What the Amazon rainforest does is it, you know, just through the normal process of, of photosynthesis, there's this thing called evapotranspiration. So yeah. the plants plants open up the little pores on their leaves in order to take in carbon dioxide to photosynthesize. And when they do that, for every molecule of carbon dioxide they take in, they give off about 140 molecules of water. What that means is when the plants are growing, they're emitting incredible quantities of water vapor into the air and that water vapor forms clouds those clouds reflect heat back into outer space and help to slow global warming and really crucially those clouds are what are responsible for a lot of the rainfall especially during the dry season months and the dry season is when the forests are much are far and away the most vulnerable to fires and destruction so the rainforest helps in a, in a system like the amazon where so much of the rainfall is being recycled and regenerated, produced by the forest itself, then it just follows logic to, to realize that once you chop down enough of that forest, that that recycling is going to break down and suddenly you're going to move from a system that's sort of moist enough in the dry season months to stop catastrophic fires to one in which it's not. Uh, moist enough. So that is and, a tipping point we're talking about. Yeah, that? and the other thing that we're doing that's really scary is that it, it's it's a double whammy because yes, um, the land use is uh, the destruction of the forest is reducing the rainfall, but also remember that we're opening up the forest, we're fragmenting them, loggers are going in and, and ripping out trees out of the forest. And so when you open up the forest, you tear holes in the, the canopy, you can, the rainforest thick canopy overhead, you can kind of think of it like a protective skin. And it keeps the in, interior of the forest very humid and moist and sort of very windless. It's a very humid, ultra humid environment. So you start ripping the forest up and fragmenting it and logging it, and it becomes dried out. Um, and, you know, you get a lot of for instance, logging operations, you get a lot of slash and fine debris, which is very flammable uh, on the forest floor. And then you have all these roads because the loggers build roads and the miners build roads and cattle ranchers build roads. So it's suddenly a lot easier for people to get in there. And guess what? Fire is the main way that people, along with bulldozers, but fire is one of the main ways that people clear uh, forests in the Amazon. So we see just in a typical year, sixty or seventy thousand fires in the Amazon basin. So it's just like a, a seventy thousand. Yeah, that's an average year, and these are fires that are big enough to detect from outer space. So they're not just it's not a campfire. We're talking about a fire that would probably be burning a few acres of forest, at least. In some cases, they burn vast areas. But the bottom line is this: there's two things happening. You're not just drawing out the forest, but you're opening it up and fragmenting it and making it much more vulnerable to fires and hugely increasing the, num the number of igni ignition sources because of people yeah. going in so, and lighting all those fires. So the bottom line is, you know, you've got all this happening at once. And uh, 
it's it's just kind of scary built on top of more scary. Uh, and so trying to predict what the exact tipping point would be in a system, I mean, it's a little bit like you've got this punch drunk boxer and he's getting hit again and again and again and he's staggering around and, you know, and you're like, well, which punch is going to knock him out? And right now that's kind of what the Amazon's looking like. We're just not really sure which punch is, is going to be that fatal one that really knocks him flat and out of the game. But that's kind of where the Amazon is right now. And what I compare it to is a, is a, a, a boxer that's being yeah. annihilated yeah. by a flurry of, of assaults and insults that are coming at it from this uh, tsunami of human, human uses and human pressures. And we got Jair Bozo Naro as the new heavyweight champion of the world uh, stepping into the ring here in uh, 2019. Unbelievable. One, one, one more question, and then we really are going to, uh, to segue into China. One thing that I have read conflicting reports about the Amazon jungle, just 180 degrees separate. I, I could swear I, it's probably in Manga Bay or somewhere. I remember reading almost two years ago that the Amazon rainforest had already flipped from uh, a carbon uh, sink to a carbon source. And I am still reading uh, virtually every time a, a more mainstream media article even goes there, they're still saying that the Amazon rainforest is, is absorbing carbon from the planet. And I have read other studies that say it is already flipped. Where, where do you come in on, on this debate? Has it flipped? And if it hasn't, how soon before that happens? Well, the reason that there's this confusion is it depends on exactly what you're talking about when you say the Amazon. So the studies that suggest that the Amazon is a carbon sink and that the forests are absorbing more carbon than they give off and in, in, in essence becoming bigger and more massive over time, those studies are focusing on the intact forests of the Amazon. So these are the old growth yeah. undisturbed forests. And current evidence suggests that that sink effect is probably still happening. In other words, the Amazon, uh, to some degree, is kind of trying to help save us from ourselves in terms of global warming. And it's absorbing, the best numbers suggest that it might be absorbing uh, somewhere on the order of half a, a billion tons of carbon a year, which would be, um, what would be about two, two, two billion tons of carbon dioxide a year. Now... The other question is, is what happens if you not just look at those intact forests, but also the areas that are being destroyed and logged and degraded and burned? Now, those areas are absolutely a massive carbon source. They're giving off enormous amounts of carbon dioxide and in some cases methane, because if you flood them, flood them with hydro dams, they'll be giving off a lot of methane, which is a very dangerous greenhouse gas also. And if you put fertilizer on them, they're giving off nitrous oxide, which is another bad greenhouse gas. Bottom line is, those areas are a huge carbon source. Now, if you add those two things up, the carbon sink and the carbon source, overall, across the Amazon, with all the different habitats, degraded and non-degraded, the Amazon's almost certainly a carbon source. Okay. In other words, it's there's it's producing the, more carbon than it's absorbing, but it's not nearly as bad a carbon source as it would be if the forests, the, the, the intact forests, were not absorbing yeah, 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 yeah. some of that extra CO2. And uh, I think I think that's the reason why it gets a little confusing because it's not always clear what people you, what exactly people are talking about. Okay, well, I am so glad you, you cleared that up for me because there, there is a whole lot of confusion, and I doubt any mainstream media newspaper reporter or editor ha has any idea what any of that means. Okay, so now we're going to segue from Brazil. Now, obviously, Brazil, uh, Jair Bolsonaro, is no man is an island, and not, not even a country is an island. Let's get into the global connections of, of Brazil, just as, as one poster child 
of the, this whole Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, and I'm pretty much just going to turn you loose to do your to, to do your spiel and let us know in no uncertain terms what this what this thing is and what it could just looking ahead over the next few decades if this thing really does happen what could this mean for uh, for this planet uh, in the 21st century so bill lawrence run with that okay well sam um and i think this is no exaggeration the belt and road is the most dangerous environmental trend that we're facing today uh, outright the most dangerous thing and i add in there i include in that uh, climate change and everything else wow. the reason is because the belt and road is an absolutely massive and completely unprecedented tsunami of development it's currently spanning nearly 130 nations across the planet and it will be the biggest thing it's actually the biggest development initiative or scheme ever in human history so you know people used to talk about the marshall plan in world war ii when the united states spent so many billions of dollars uh, uh trillions yeah. of dollars trying to rebuild europe uh which was critical well the the belt and road is bigger than the marshall plan by far and essentially what it's trying to do is to massively expand roads dams uh railways ports, uh, other kinds of energy projects, mining, oil and gas development, um, lots of different kinds of land exploitation um, across the planet, um, especially in developing nations, which absolutely legitimately need uh, smart and good development and good, good, good infrastructure. But this is being done in an extremely aggressive way, and it's it's unprecedented in its scale. It started off as this vision to link China with um, Europe and the Middle East and Africa and South Asia, and it's continued to expand over time, and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Uh, in early 2018, China announced that all of Latin America and the Caribbean would also be included in the Belt and Road. And then about the same time, they announced that the whole Antarctic region would be included in the Belt and Road. And I think also the Antarctic region, China is now the biggest, overwhelmingly the biggest. That's what you said. Antarctic. So, so you, meant the, you meant to say the Arctic the first time. So it's pole to pole all over the, it's the whole planet is what, well, except possibly the exception of the United States. About the only one you didn't mention in there was the U.S. Uh, it is probably happening here too, uh, just a little more quietly. So, uh, so, so who's the winner? I mean, other. I mean, clearly China's the winner. I mean, they're they're not doing this uh, for anyone's benefit except their own. Oh no, it's no, it's very much a Chinese initiative with driven by Chinese interests. Now, um, what it's being packaged and sold as, of course, is something as an opportunity for developing nations to develop. There's an, been an enormous amount of greenwashing that's been associated with this, and it begins right at the top with President Xi Jinping, who's used words like sustainable and green and uh, carbon neutral and you know all the, all the kind of buzzwords that people tend to associate with uh, sustainable development. Green civilization, that's been another one. But in fact, when you look at it in reality, and I'm, I've been doing this for a long time, and you look at, and this is where we can talk at great depth, um, the way this is lining up is going, it's going to be incredibly environmentally uh, destructive. And it's, um, I would also say, by the way, that the Belt and Road has moved in a direction that is actually now increasingly becoming even dangerous to China. Um, in some ways, they've bitten off so much. Yeah. And, and um, they're, the scale of it is so big. And one thing that really distinguishes China as an investor and as a promoter of projects from almost all the other financiers around the world, and that's everything from 
the World Bank down to individual billionaires. I mean, the thing that really distinguishes China is their willingness to take on extremely high risk projects. And that could be high risk in terms of environmental terms or in terms of the economic or political or financial or reputational risk. China is has this uh, tendency to essentially, and they'll work with anybody, even the most corrupt uh, and disreputable governments. Um, and they've had this longstanding habit of sort of doing this. Now, um, what's actually happening is China is starting, is, is accumulated because they're investing all this money and lending all this money. China doesn't give money out. China doesn't, doesn't really use aid the way a lot of, say, for instance, Western nations have done in the past is to give out aid. It's actually giving away money. China just lends money. So there's, it's always got to be paid back. But what China's done is there's been a huge increase in Chinese debt, so their foreign debt. So China's gone from having almost no debt to having a really high amount of debt, and a lot of that debt is really high risk, and it's in danger of defaulting. Now, this is where, think about what happened, you know, what drove the global financial crisis? Well, it was the U.S., and it was bad loans that were made for um, you know, high risk um, in home loans in particular, but it's exactly the same thing happening now in China. And the key thing now to, to realize is that the Belt and Road, because we live in this very globally connected economy, globalized economy, um, the Belt and Road is not just an environmental danger now, it's actually becoming a growing danger to China's own domestic economy, and it's increasingly becoming a danger to the entire global economy because if i mean the same we could have another gfc if this thing keeps going the way it's been going now um right now i mean the 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 belton road is just exploding and um i have to i'm kind of proud to say that we were uh, my group you know have been calling this out for a long time originally we felt a little bit kind of like the lone voice in the wilderness and a number of people were saying, like, look, you can't really criticize this. You're criticizing a nation. You know, if you want to talk about a certain kind of development, that's one thing. But to actually focus in on, you know, a particular nation, it's just not appropriate. But we persisted with this. And I think a lot of people now are starting to open up their eyes and realize how dangerous this Belt and Road is. And for lots and lots of different reasons. Um, Sam, I can, I can drill down into a lot of depth in terms of what it is about the Belt and Road that makes it so scary. Um, I'll just say a couple things real quick. Um, one is that you've got to understand that the Chinese population in mainland China is completely indoctrinated about the Belt and Road and that information does not flow freely there. People in China don't hear bad things about the Belt and Road. Um, the news gets filtered out or it's stopped by China's great firewall. President Xi Jinping has made that firewall and that inflow of information even much stricter um, since he's come into power, especially in the last five years or so. The Belt and Road is inscribed in the central charter of the Communist Party, thanks to Xi Jinping, and that means it's a crime in China to criticize it. Um, and so what you've got, also what you've got in China is historically a lot of corruption being used both domestically inside and outside of China, just as part of their culture. Um, they ha there has been a crackdown on corruption activities inside of China, but not internationally. And so when China commenced its so-called going, go glo going global program in the early 1990s, essentially all its financiers and companies and corporations and entrepreneurs were just essentially told, go out and make money. And that was the only instructions they were given. That going global thing happened just after the Soviet Union had collapsed and the Chinese could see that these top-down controlled economies were, weren't, weren't functioning very well. And so they basically just cut their corporations and their uh, banks and others and, and entrepreneurs loose and said, just go get become rich and be, to become wealthy is glorious. Well, that was actually a a quote from a Chinese leader. And so what's happened is you've got Chinese corporations and, and financiers just running around. And here's another really striking thing. Like almost every 
uh, industrial nation, the U.S., the U U.K., Australia, all have legislation, laws that make it illegal for, for business people to engage in illegal activities, to, in corruption and bribery. China doesn't have anything like that. And so there's, and this is something, you know, you can go on to Transparency International, which is probably the most respected international organization that monitors corruption. And there's a quote on there. It says, China has never, ever had, uh, had any kind of prosecution on any business person or corporation or money lender or entrepreneur working overseas for, for corrupt practices. I mean, that's an incredible statistic. Um, that's not to claim that, you know, countries like the U.S. and England and, and Germany and others are perfect in terms of their inter international development practices. Nobody's claiming that. But at least you've got laws and at least you've got the duty of responsibility, um, the, duty, the, the duty of diligence on the business people to try to do the right thing. In China, there's nothing like that. There's no controls. And so you essentially have this unbridled onslaught of Chinese corporations and financiers moving all over the planet with essentially no um, constraints at all. And China's practices are very much like, oh, you know, we're going to do the development. And uh, the classic model is we'll, we'll lend you money. So it'll be Chinese money, oftentimes used to employ Chinese corporations, which very often are employing uh, Chinese workers, uh, employees. And then we'll build a project for you. You'll get the project. And you'll owe us a lot of money. Um, and also, then, very oftentimes, there are projects that China wants because China wants some kind of natural resource like minerals or oil and gas or timber. So, well, that's a the lot bottom the, line. I mean, it, it, I mean, this is this isn't exactly a a resource war. It's a a planet wide resource grab. Uh, is, is, is what I'm hearing. Um, I, mean, what, I mean, what does this look like on the ground? What it looks like on the ground is a, is a bunch of trees falling over and a bunch of mines, open pit mines, and uh, the super fun sites. And, mm -hmm. you know, let, let's zero in. Just pick one. Uh, what, what did you say? You said there were over 7,000 of these. So... Mm -hmm. Throw a dart, Bill Lawrence. Just, just, just bring it home to. I uh, just, just pick, pick one of your, your quote favorite, uh, in inexcusable assaults on Mother Earth. Uh, this indefensible, and uh, so, so we can get a, a more visceral picture of what this looks like on the ground instead of talking in all these big generalities. So, what's your favorite assault on the planet, as it were? Yeah, well, it's a very target-rich environment, Sam, so I've got lots of possibilities just, to choose just from. Just stick in your thumb, Jack Horner, and pull out a plum. Yeah. All right, I'm going to point right now to Sumatra, Indonesia. Okay. And in, in, here in this, the, this great island of Sumatra, which is one of the biologically richest areas on the planet, there's a very small tract of forest, and in that tract of forest, which is that forest is only about one tenth the size of Sydney, Australia. Okay, so that's how small it is. Inside that one surviving tractor forest is the world's rarest great ape. Okay, it's called the Tapanuli orangutan, and there's only about 800 of them left alive. All right, so it's one of our closest living relatives, and it's one of only seven species of great ape alive on the planet. And nobody would look at that little tiny tractor forest where this. <laughs> And, and also, there's lots of other rare species yeah. there, too, like Sumatran tigers and other things. Anyway, but the most critically endangered uh, great ape on the planet, no one would touch this. Well, the World Bank looked at, so the Indonesians wanted to put in a hydro dam project in that area, because there is a river flowing through it. Yeah. And they wanted to put in this big hydro project, and the World Bank looked at it, and the International Finance Corporation looked at it, and the Asian Development Bank looked at it, and they all said, absolutely not, we're not going to touch it. Well, China came in, the Bank of China and Chinese Na China's National Hydro Authority, Sino-Hydro, and they're absolutely behind it, and they're funding it. And um, Indonesia set up a corporation which is now doing it, and the bulldozers are roaring ahead, and they're creating this massive hydro project which is chopping in half 
the last major surviving population of this orangutan. And so one this of the most... is, I know there's been some fights, but th this, I mean, the bulldozers are out there grind, right now while we're having this conversation, the trees are falling and the bulldozers are roaring in this last little Garden of Eden in this part of Sumatra. Yes, they are. That's absolutely, it's, it's happening. And there's this, we've been involved in this battle for a couple of years now, and there's been a lot of other people that have joined in. I mean, there's been an enormous effort by the international scientific community, by scientists inside Indonesia, by many conservationists and others to try to stop this from happening. And China is essentially just given the middle finger uh, and has also Indonesia. Um, to pretty much the planet and saying, you know, we're going ahead with this project. And it's been um, a lesson in just, um, I don't know, you know, what did uh, Roosevelt say when the Chinese bombed Pearl Harbor? This is the day that shall live in infamy. I mean, it's almost that kind of thing to me from an environmental yeah. perspective. I can't imagine a worse project and a project that you would put your finger, point your finger at and say, no sane person would promote that. And especially now it's become in some sense kind of an iconic example of what the Belt and Road can and is doing um, and would proceed with it. And yet it's, it's, it's insanity and it is happening and it has not stopped. It has not slowed all that Chinese, the Chinese entrepreneurs and funders and others done is hunkered down and they've hired PR firms and they've just blanketed, um, so especially in Indonesia, they blanketed the public there with this just wave after wave of what I'd call greenwashing. And, um, you know, about why this project isn't so bad and why it's benign and et cetera, et cetera. And you've got all the top scientific experts, all the orangutan experts, all the forest fragmentation and land use experts, everybody screaming and decrying this project and saying it's ecological insanity. How can you be doing this? Um, and, you know, who we're arguing against are, are basically PR firms that specialize in corporate crisis management. And that's, and these guys are effective, but I'll tell you what, they're, they're, a, oh, they're a bunch of uh, this is where I want to use some four-letter words, <laughs> and uh, I'll just say that you know they operated it. There, there's no ethical uh, boundaries to the way these guys operate, and the way scientists are constrained, you know, by uh, essentially using the truth and and uh, you know you know not you know we have certain bounds of of, of uh, acceptable conduct, and <laughs> so much big lies and distortion and ridiculous stuff and, and I mean oh, I mean we've written multiple open letters to, to the president uh, President Jakawi um, there's been a I mean let, at least the temperature on the issue has been raised but you wanted an example there's there's an apocryphal example. So of, what is of, China uh, getting out of this deal? I mean why are they uh, you know what what are they getting out of the China? This one project, they got 7,000 more to, to move ahead with. What is it about this one project that they just, it, it, they just don't want to create a precedent that we can be pushed around? I guess, and, uh, you know, honestly, I'm not sure, but it's China, another key characteristic about China is a real lack of transparency. A lack of transparency about their decision-making process, a lack of transparency about their financial activities, I mean, that's something that really distinguishes Chinese corporations and banks and lenders from the rest, much of the rest of the world is, a, is an absolute lack. You don't know where the money is. You don't know where the money's going. You don't know who's getting it. You don't know how it's being used. I mean, so that's what you're up against is this kind of monolithic wall. Um, well, I'm so, going to take a wild you know, guess, Bill, what, that, that a very few people, a very tiny handful of people are making a bucket load of money somewhere well, yeah. if you follow the money there wouldn't be that many people at the end of the trail uh, am i do you think i'm on the right track or am i being whatever in your opinion no i don't think you're being hyperbolic at all i the that's one of the key things that we use to identify so-called you know bad infrastructure projects is that 
and unfortunately there are many of them, but is that they tend to have very dis unequal, disproportionate economic benefits. So what you'd like to see with, you know, a good development project is one that's got um, some level of uh, economic uh, equitability so that not just a few fat cats and land developers are getting rich and a few politicians, but the money's being spread around more equally. And of course, you like to see something that's sustainable and not going to be massively environmentally destructive. Um, the lack of transparency alone that tends to characterize most of these Belt and Road projects makes it very difficult to try to do anything. And what's happening is Lots and lots of projects are getting approved before really the public yeah. even has an opportunity to understand them. And that's, again, how China operates as they go in. Another thing that characterizes Chinese entrepreneurs and financiers operating overseas is they, they're so aggressive and bold about it. They tend to actually go in and go right up to the very high level. So they'll go right to the level of the minister or, you know, the ministry or the minister's close associates, and they'll bribe right at that very high level. And that then gives them carte blanche access to natural resources and whatever it is that they want. So there's a level of aggressiveness and just sheer, um, you know, boldness and brazenness about the way that China has operated because they don't have the constraints. They don't have they don't have the, the media. They have among the most closed media on the planet. They don't have criticism. They don't have laws. They don't have constraints. They're essentially, and so they just are operating in this predatory, incredibly aggressive fashion. And you ask Sam, what is China getting out of it? Well, China's getting very wealthy. Well, and it's also a uh, few people meaning, are the average Chinese uh, citizen isn't getting any. They, I can't imagine the average Chinese person w w hearing about this story would say, yeah, mm -hmm. I support that. Well, look, in China, it's not that I mean, it's not quite that black and white. And that firstly, um, the average Chinese person is only hearing good news about yeah, the Belt and Road. So, so it's completely biased. Also, look, to be fair, the Chinese middle class has grown a lot, yeah. and at the average Chinese person, is, there are many, many more wealthy, really super wealthy people in, in China, China. And but also, there's been a huge growth of the Chinese middle class. So, I mean, I think one also has to acknowledge the fact that China has become enriched at many different ways and many different levels. Um, and it's having all kinds of effects, at, you know, China's military, China's industrial capacity, China's, uh, I mean, China's become much more wealthy and much more powerful at many different levels. And the Belt and Road is partly economic, but it's also partly political and geopolitical, and it's about gaining influence, and it's about broadening China. It's, you know, Chinese, the Chinese have long taken a, 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 a long perspective. So they, they tend to, they don't tend to look two years down the line or four years down the line. They tend to look many decades down the line. Okay, we're gonna... So their strategies are playing out at this. It's kind of like a, a chess game where they're looking yeah. at, um, you know, big long-term strategies. But the bottom line is, is it's, um, it's a tsunami of development. It's happening incredibly rapidly. And it's really very much built around this no notion of, rapidly enriching and empowering uh, China. Okay, let's take the here because we're down to our, well, 15 minutes at the max. So let's take uh, this, uh, the, the long, the long view like China does. I want you as, uh, as an environmentalist to look several decades into the future. Where is this leading the planet to, Bill Lawrence? Well, you know, it's interesting because I think if one would have said a year ago, one would have said, um, well, it's leading to China becoming overwhelmingly the dominant superpower on the planet. It would be leading to all kinds of changes where it really became the center of economic activity and, and a hugely rapidly escalating uh, global military presence, not just in the South China Sea, but moving into the Indian Ocean, into Africa, into and the Arctic region, many parts of the world. I think you would be seeing the yuan rather than the, the U.S. dollar becoming the dominant currency. There would be many, many social changes and, and many political changes happening. Um, some people now are starting to think that China, you know, may be overreaching. 
And there's enough danger signals now that, you know, even even within China, where no one is, I mean, uh, Xi Jinping is the president and the leader of China for life. He can stay there. He's now moved things around where he effectively can stay in office as long as he wants. And so no one wants to get offside with him. No one wants to confront him. But even in, even with that, people are starting to whisper and are starting to say, oh, look at the debt. Look at these dangers, you know. So um, I think it's um, the best case scenario for me would be if people, especially in developing countries, can understand better how aggressive and how um, predatory and how self-interested China is. And by doing that, with, with the developing nations can just, one, try to slow things down a little bit so that the public's, the general public has an opportunity to understand what's happening. That's the biggest thing, because there's so little transparency. Everything's happening so fast. Things are getting approved so quickly. There's so much corruption. Um, so many projects are being approved that should never get approved that are not in the public interest. These nations are going to be saddled with enormous debt with squandering their natural resources, with um, the increasing economic disparity where you get a few really rich, wealthy people, powerful people, and then the average person, or the poverty is just increasing. Um, so economic disparity, the increasing political instability. I mean, this is not good development. It's bad development. It's got everything about it that just says this is not the way you want to see development proceeding. Um, if the nations that are that are being subjected, the 130 odd nations that are being subjected to this Belt and Road, can just understand that look, we want to operate in our own self-interest, and we need to be careful about which projects we allow to proceed, and make sure that they're they're smart projects for us. If that message can penetrate, it would have an enormous impact, and I think it would be positive and beneficial. Um, Right now, you know, a lot of countries are just, I mean, you've got people in power and they've got enormous prospects for becoming instantly extremely wealthy. And it's just pushing things in the direction of rampant approval of a lot of the projects that China wants. China is coming in with an enormous amount of money and spreading it around. And again, without the transparency, we don't even know where the money's going. We just know that it's going in lots of places and, and a lot of things are happening very, very fast. So I think uh, I see a lot of danger signals, but I, I see danger signals for China too. And uh, I, uh, I'm, there's an enormous amount of greenwashing going on right now. I don't think you can trust the Chinese government at all. I don't think you can really believe much of what's coming out of the uh, of the Chinese government's official uh, portals and mouthpieces and newspapers and President Xi Jinping, it's we've simply seen for too long that they'll essentially say anything that they want in order to try to advance their own interests. And uh, I'm not claiming that um, you know every other nation. I wouldn't say for any, a lot of things coming out of President Trump's mouth are true either. So, uh, but the bottom line is, I think China's a uh, in a very dangerous position right now, and it's dragging the rest of the world into this equally dangerous uh, morass with it. So, um, again, I just repeat, Sam, that I think the Belt and Road is the most dangerous thing we've seen, um, certainly in our in my lifetime, and uh, I think in our children's lifetimes. And I think we just need to have an enormous increase in awareness about what's going on, because otherwise we're going to be uh, we're going to be dealing with a tornado here and all the destructive impacts that occur as a result of that. Okay, well, that's, all right, we, we are heading into 50 minutes, and, and I really wanted to get into a third subject. We're only going to have five minutes. Uh, sustainable palm oil. Is there such a thing as sustainable palm oil, or is there not? Well, in theory, there is. I mean, if palm oil is being planted on land that's already been cleared and, say, degraded land or land that's not being used, and it's not important wildlife habitat, it's not forests, um, you know, th those are examples where you'd, you'd say, yeah, look, palm oil is essentially being used in a sustainable way. The problem is that that's not really what's happening with palm oil. Um, 
Palm oil right now is being grown, we know, in many places where the forest has just been knocked down. And there's really very little doubt that palm oil has emerged as one of the major drivers of forest destruction, especially of destruction of tropical forests, which are the biologically richest and then probably environmentally most important real estate on the planet, which also have the biggest impacts on the planet's climate because of all their carbon storage and evapotranspiration and everything else that they do. So sadly, and the other thing that one has to say is that Indonesia and Malaysia are pushing palm oil in such an aggressive way that, and they produce between them 85% of the world's palm oil, but they're also pushing it now to be grown all over the world. Um, They've been so aggressive and over the top in the way that they've promoted it, and they're also trying to undercut the measures that have been brought into place to try to control and to make palm oil more sustainable. So if you didn't have, I mean, I think if Indonesia and Malaysia, in a sense, were operating in a more responsible way and were not so completely one-eyed about the way that they think about palm oil, and they also have been indoctrinated very heavily and they believe their own PR about palm oil. And if palm oil were sort of grown and and managed in the right way, it is, look, it's very productive. It produces, you know, it's, it's, it's a highly profitable crop. It produces a lot of oil per uh, acre of land. Um, It has a lot of potential, but the problem is, is it's just, it's like the genie that's gotten out of the bottle and it's being, um, promoted in the wrong ways, and then what we're not seeing is really much sustainable use of palm oil at all. Um, another really bad thing is that the palm oil industry and lobby, which is so powerful, has stopped um, s- stores and products from listing palm oil on their products. So if you pick up a candy bar or some soap or some kind of product, at the grocery store, it'll just say vegetable oil. And a lot of consumers want to know whether or not there's yeah. palm oil in there. And so far, it's a bit like the cigarette manufacturers it said for a long time, you know, they, they, they fought, you know, having any kind of warning on a package of cigarettes to say that the, these are considered dangerous to your health. Well, that's exactly what's happening right now with palm oil. And so you, you don't even know whether or not a product has palm oil in it. But vegetable that, oil probably means palm oil, or there's a very good chance. Vegetable oil very likely means palm oil. But the problem is is that, you know, <laughs> most food products have vegetable oil in them and a lot of other things from cosmetics to all kinds of things, including also biofuel, uh, can have palm oil in it. So bottom line is um, I think a lot of palm oil is not sustainable. Um, I think it has the potential to be a really valuable asset on the planet, but it's being misused and uh, aggressively overused in a way that it's causing much more environmental destruction than what it needs to do. And there really needs to be a tightening down and a constraint placed on it, because if if not, it's just going to kind of run like a tsunami over much of the tropical world. And I think Indonesia and Malaysia in particular deserve really significant criticism. And we could get, we don't have time to talk about no, the politics. We don't. Yeah, well, I do appreciate but that. What, but... they've done, what they've done has been really unconscionable in terms of the way that they've promoted and tried to drive and force different yeah. companies and entities and, and groups in the world to use palm oil. Well, I thank you for that, and to wrap this excellent discussion up, as I always do with my guests, if you were not talking to Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles for one hour, and you had 60 seconds to bring the Bill Lawrence message to the world, what would that 60-second sound bite to the mainstream media sound like to wrap this up? I would say this. When we're talking about this tsunami of development that's happening around the world right now, I would just say this. Just try to slow things down, okay, wherever possible. You cannot trust environmental impact assessments, EIAs. You can't trust them. Don't think for a second that you can. Slow the projects down. Just give people and the public an opportunity 
to understand what's really going on. And so I would just say this, we're being, we're being assaulted by this incredible avalanche of unwise uh, development and mixed in amongst that is some sustainable development and just slow things down so people, so the public can actually have an opportunity to see what's really happening. And if that can occur, then a lot of the really bad projects will die on their own. But right now that's not really happening. And what we're seeing is an incredible number of really unwise, ill-advised, and, and economically, socially, politically, environmentally harmful projects are going ahead that should never happen. They should never get off the drawing board. So we need more openness, more transparency, and just slow things down so people can have a chance to try to understand what's happening. Okay, and with that, Bill Lawrence, uh, thank you very much for taking a hour out of your busy schedule, and more importantly, thank you very much for everything that you do. Stick around for just a minute after we say bye, but right now, say goodbye to the folks, and we will see you down the line. Okay, and, and, and I, oh yeah, and I did want to add, folks, I'm going to put the link to the ALERT website, the Alliance of Leading Environmental Researchers and Thinkers, number one of which is Bill Lawrence. Thank you, Bill. Pleasure, Sam.